So we, we've spoken about aldol condensations and we've spoken about across aldol uh, reactions. And uh, what we've been working with there is just simple aldehydes and, and ketones. Um, you can also do them with, a, with an ester. But the, the key thing, uh, what I want to show you here is just a slight upgrade to this uh, type of reaction, the Nouvelle-Aldol reaction. You don't need to know this word. Um, it's actually just the chemistry that's uh, a little bit more important, is uh, something along this line. So we can take a, in this case, this is a diethylmalonate uh, ester, but what we see is it's a 1,3-dicarbonyl uh, compound. Uh, and in the presence of an aldehyde, and um, uh, in this case, um, what we're going to see is what's actually rather cool about this reaction is that we can use an inalizable aldehyde. So I'll just take some random uh, inalizable aldehyde. This is really in inalizable. Uh, we can get a condensation to occur that will give us this product uh, over here. So it's an OET, OET. And we will do the old old condensation, and, and that product would look like, like this. So um, here we've got this carbon connecting to that carbon over there, and that's the double bond. That's part of the condensation reaction uh, that's occurred. Um, so uh, that's what we're doing. Now, uh, in terms of old old condensations, you should look at this, and you would have no problem in believing me in drawing out a mechanism of what happens over there. Um, the question is, is why can we do this reaction in the presence of an inalizable um, aldehyde? And the answer to that is actually rather simple. It's because the pKa of this carbon that we want to actually generate the enolate on is very different from the pKa of this one over there. This one is sitting in the region of 10, and this one's sitting in the region of 20 to 25. So um, there's a huge difference in terms of their pKa value. So in this reaction, we wouldn't use sodium hydroxide because we would just uh, deprotonate there. We could use sodium ethoxide to get it to work, um, but actually it's simple enough with, um, with us to use just a weak uh, amine base, a secondary amine such as uh, pyridine, like that we can use, and, and often sometimes in fact, uh, we can even weaken this even further by just um, adding some acetic acid to it. So we're actually making a, a buffer type system that's, uh, that's occurring over there. Um, the combination of reagents there is not important. Um, the, the most important thing to take home with this is that this is just a, an aldol condensation reaction. Um, and what's cool about it is that you can use a weak base to effect this um, and that means you can do this in, in under thermodynamic conditions, nice room temperature, you can stir things together, you don't have to be uh, working with very strong bases and trying to get uh, control, even with an inalizable uh, aldehyde. So that's an advantage of the Knuvelagel reaction. Um, of course, one of the things we can do, and what we've learned, is that you can also probably do a de you, can, well, you can do a decarboxylation of this, Move this one over here, uh, and so that you could just get the the acid, the alkene acid, conjugated acid. Um, but there is actually a variation of the Knuvel-Aldol reaction which does this straight away, and it's called the Dubna uh, variation. And here again, uh, you don't need to know the names of these. It's just because these were the people who um, who discovered them all. Um, so they called that, but really the important thing here is the chemistry and the Dubna variation is just to start with the carboxylic acid itself, uh, the diacid. Uh, and when you do that and you treat this now with, again, you can use that same, let's just use that same inalizable aldehyde, the product that we will get at the end is, whoops, sorry, it's not R, but pH, uh, is this. Over there. So what we have is there's our carbon of that one, there's the carbon of this, um, which gives us that bond over there. But what, what we see is that actually a decarboxylation has happened in situ. Uh, typically this is done in solvents like uh, pyridine, uh, and which is also acting as a um, as a base. Um, and it's a it's a it's a, the, the mechanism is kind of what you would think. 
But remember, be, be very careful. Don't when you do this mechanism, don't just think, okay, I'm going to deprotonate there, make the inulated work on. Look at the molecule as a whole, and notice that this is a diacid, and those are the most acidic protons. Uh, the weird thing with this is that the the nucleophile that we're going to generate is actually effectively a trianine, um, and which you would think is actually very difficult to uh, to make. Um, and the only reason we can make it is because of uh, the, the stabilization that you get all right, um, between this whole system uh, um, over, over there. So it's actually just a dianine. Um, and so we can remove the two protons. When we remove this proton over there, it can stabilize, gives a negative charge. A proton can come back because the proline is just a weak uh, base, so it can donate its proton back. And you get this stabilized intermediate being formed uh, over there. And, and that's why we are able to deprotonate um, over there, even though we're forming a, a, a dianine. Uh, this then reacts with the aldehyde. You can draw the arrow push. And of course, because it's under basic conditions, you'll see you should be able to draw the arrow push to get to here um, just by pushing in the electrons of the carboxylate salts. And you'll see that you can delocalize and uh, get a product like that. So you should be able to do the mechanism. Um, this is nice because of just the structure that you can get over there. You're effectively taking an aldehyde and you're adding on a carbon with a carboxylic acid at the end over there. Um, it's a nice reaction to do. There's other ways of doing this, for instance, biobitic type uh, reactions. Um, but um, this is just uh, uh, another one. Okay.